Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be showing you how to create beautiful atmospheric renders like this using the EV real-time rendering engine with Blender. Before we start, I want to let you know that this video is sponsored by Sketchfab, so let's get into it. EV is capable of producing some really beautiful renders, and today we're going to be focusing on using volumetrics and particle systems to create atmospheric effects that will enhance your renders, turning them from basic flat scenes into complex, full and detailed compositions. Throughout the video, this dropship model is going to be the focus of our demonstrations. It was created by CG Pitbull and I picked it up from the Sketchfab store. So to start us from scratch, I'm going to disable all of these effects. And now we can begin. Now this model by itself looks great, but there's all this extra empty space around the subject that's not contributing to the mood in any way. Ideally, there would be some kind of environment that's suitable for the model, but a lot of the time, creating a render environment is a large time investment and takes a lot of effort. But if you know a few tricks, you really don't need to invest that much time to make your render much more interesting to look at. Usually, one of the first things I'll do is add a bit of world volume, and you can see here that I've already got a principled volume shader in the node graph and plugged into the volume input of the world output node. An appropriate value for this scene would be something like 0.06. And you can see that when the surrounding lights react with the volume, they create a nice blending of light and color values to make the background not feel as bland. So if you already have a good lighting set up around your object, you'll be able to see where the light is coming from more clearly. But a flat gradient is still a bit simple, so what we can actually do is use a generated noise texture to vary the density in 3D space, and make it look a bit more like we're inside of a cloud. So in the world nodes, you can see I've already prepared for this. We have a generated noise texture plugged into a color ramp, plugged into a math node, which is set to the multiply mode, and this value is what we're going to use as our density input. So if I plug this in here, you can see that immediately we now have some variation. There's some slightly more dense areas and some less dense areas, and this helps to give us a sense of depth, because some areas of the object may be in a denser part of the volume than others. Now to get this effect looking nice in the world nodes, you'd want to use a relatively low scale value for the generated noise texture, because you can see that if you go too high, the frequency of the details becomes way too high and it just becomes really noisy. But you know, with stylistic choice, maybe that will look nice for you. And passing it through a color ramp lets us restrict the range of the density in response to the generated texture. So you can see that as I drag the black handle, less of the volume becomes visible. But this effect, for me, is still a bit too simple, and we can take the use of volumes further by creating more detailed volume objects that can actually be moved around the scene. And because they can be moved, it means we can manually place them in front of and behind objects, which can again help in giving the sense of distance. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to activate a couple of objects I prepared earlier. You can see that we now have these wispy cloudy effects in the scene. There's some higher frequency details at the back and some lower frequency details at the front. This time, to show you how this works, we're going to be looking at the object nodes instead of the world nodes because these are 3D objects in the scene. And we can see this here, it's just a basic primitive cube with the material applied. And as I move it around, you can see how the volume data reacts to the light. So there's two objects. The first one has the low frequency details and the second one has the high frequency ones. And the materials are mostly the same, but the first one is slightly more complex. So we'll start with having a look at that. What we have here is a similar setup to the world nodes, where you can see we have a principled volume shader plugging into the volume input of the material output node. We also have the multiply and the color ramp. But instead of having just a basic generated noise texture, we actually have a slightly different setup here. We have two noise textures with different values, so they're producing different amounts of distortion and noise, and then we're mixing them together before we put them through the color ramp. And as well as this, we have a texture coordinate and a mapping node, and we're taking the object coordinate data and passing that through the vector value. This is not required, but I find that using the object data makes the results a bit more interesting, and also having a mapping node allows you to animate the contents of the volume. So if you wanted to have the smoke moving across the screen, you could do that by animating one of these values in the node. So the second noise texture has a slightly higher level of distortion and roughness. If we take a look in the 3D view, and if I reduce the black handle, you can see how the combination of this creates this interesting, wispy, smoky cloud effect that actually looks really pretty just with lights in it. So if I come right up in front of the dropship here, it looks like we're going through a cloud. But now I'm going to return this handle back to its normal position so we can carry on. Let's take a look at the nodes for the next volume. See this one's more simple, we're still using the texture coordinate to mapping technique, and we've only got one noise texture here. So we can still animate it if we like, but the wispy effect is actually coming from the high distortion of this noise texture. And I can show you what changing this value does. See we've got 7.8 at the moment, but if I reduce it down to like 0.5, 
we now have these longer sweeping trails of smoke. But as I increase it, they become much higher frequency and we get all of this noise. So I think 7.8 is a good compromise value here. Now with the context of a dropship model like this, we could say it's flying through the clouds, but you don't need a story like that just to make something look cool. Just having some interesting atmospherics going on can make something a lot more interesting to look at than just a flat grayscale background. But okay, we've had a good look at combining different volume systems to create some nice effects, but now we're going to move on to particle systems. So once again, I'm going to enable the two that I prepared earlier, which is the rain and the emissive streak effects. Now these are quite subtle, so you may need to look a bit hard to see them to start with, but I think they're subtle effects to make quite a big difference. Just to make it more obvious, I'm going to zoom in. If you look here on the side, we have these streaks going across the screen. They basically give the illusion of motion, as if the dropship is flying through the air and we're having these dust particles flying past. And then the raindrops can be seen here in between these streaks, and they're scattered all around the scene. Now these are quite simple to set up. Taking the example of the rain particle system, what you need is a target object to duplicate. So in this case, I have this rain object created here. And if we take a look at the nodes, you can see that it's just a single principled BSDF shader plugged into the surface output, where we have a high transmission value and a low alpha value. And it gives us this nice effect. It's basically transparent with a bit of light being caught around the edges. But just remember, if you're going to use transparent materials in Eevee, you need to set the blend mode. If you take a look in the materials tab and you find your material, if you scroll all the way down to the settings area, there's blend mode and shadow mode. You really want to focus on the blend mode here, and I've chosen alpha blend, and that will allow us to see through the object. So that's how I've created the raindrop. And the actual emission object is one of these planes up here. So I'm emitting particles from a plane, but this is definitely not the only way you can do it. So if you take a look at the particle settings tab, you can see that I've created a particle system. Now in here I've set up basic values, but under render, you can see that I've set the render as value to object, which means that it's going to make multiple instances of a source object. And we can choose what object that is from down here. So instance object is source underscore rain, which is this rain object. So you can click and choose the object this way, or if you're hovering over a value like this, you can hold E, which brings up the eyedropper tool. And so you can then choose the object like that. So that's basically what's instancing all of the raindrops, and we can see the different highlights here of where they are. But once you've set up the particle system, you need to actually play the timeline to watch them fall down, and then you can just pause it and scrub back to any point where you think it looks good. But as you might notice, the rotations of the raindrops are at slightly different angles. And that's because I have rotation enabled here, and what I've done is set the orientation axis to global Y. This basically means they'll be oriented along the global Y axis, but to get the different rotational values, you would set the randomized value to something above zero, otherwise they would all be the same. But you'll notice that as I scrub this, the particles don't actually change, and that's because, again, you need to replay the timeline to let their new positions calculate. So see how the randomizer is set to zero, and now they're all straight, facing the same way. But as I scrub it up and play the timeline again, now they have slightly different angles. The scale and scale randomness values comes back under the render section, now this is handy because it will also provide us with the illusion of distance as well, because the larger raindrops will look closer and the smaller raindrops will look further away, even if they're exactly the same distance from the camera. Now as for the particle system creating the emissive streaks, which you can see streaking across the air here, it's set up in pretty much exactly the same way. I basically duplicated the plane and then made a new instance of the particle system, but I made some slight changes. The source object is just this really long emissive strip, which is basically just a simple sphere, which was scaled really long along the z-axis. And then as for the rotation value, because I wanted the streaks to be kind of along the same rotation as the dropship itself, global Y wasn't going to work because this dropship is kind of rotated off-center. So instead I decided to use object Y. Now just to demonstrate what this means, if I have the local transform gizmo selected, if I move the rain plane out of the way for a minute, you can see that this emissive plane has the green arrow, so the y-axis, pointing off in the upper left direction here. Now this gives us a good axis to rotate the emissive lines across, because if you imagine that a line is going all the way through the dropship here, it provides us with a pivot point that we can spin the streaks around. So instead of going straight up to down, they will be going side to side like this. And if we rotate the plane, then the angle of the streaks will follow along with it. So if I rotated it this way, then they would be pointing upwards. 
So just by matching the dropship's orientation with the plane, that's how we can get it to work. And if we replay the timeline, then they will fall from the plane and fill out the scene like that. Now, of course, I've got it going from top to bottom here because I was just lazy and copied the rain particle object. But of course, in reality, you would actually want these streaks to be coming from the front here and then moving backwards. Now, you can do that, but as I say, the only reason I've done it this way is just because I'm lazy and for demonstration purposes. So looking at it from this camera position, it looks pretty good because the streaks definitely give us the sense of motion, like the dropship is moving forward. Now, I've got to remember to bring the rain plane back so we can actually get this effect back. So I'll return to the camera, replay the timeline, and pause. So yep, yeah, the rain's back. And if you wanted to make the rain more visible, then you would just go to the source object, take a look inside of the object material nodes, and say I could increase the alpha so it's definitely a lot brighter, but you really wouldn't want it that strong. So I'm going to reset that for now, but it just goes to show that you have complete creative control. But one thing I want to drive home here is that because all of these effects actually exist in 3D space rather than just 2D planes that are put up as an illusion, it means that you can get different cool camera angles without making any extra changes. So for example, having a camera here in front of the dropship would be really cool because we're in the center of those streaks as they're flying past us. And I've actually set up a camera for this already, so this would be our next render. And as I say, we don't need to move anything. The volume objects are still affecting the scene from this angle. There's still raindrops flying by and the streaks are still there. So with everything disabled, this is what we're left with. It still looks good as a 3D model, but there's a lot of empty space and there's just not as much happening. So what this goes to show is that if you want to fill in your empty space with some good looking atmospherics, it really doesn't take that much effort in EV. Just some simple use of volumetrics and particle systems can really make it pop. And it will really make people think that you've put in a lot more effort into the render. So again, just to demonstrate the change, plugging the value into the density, enabling the particle systems and the volumes, and here we go. It now looks like we're flying through a cloud. Now, of course, we've gone slightly over the top here with these effects for the sake of demonstration. You might not want to use all of these at once, but hopefully this gives you an idea of some things that you can use to give your render some more atmospheric flair and possibly even improve your portfolio. OK, so that does it for the bulk of the video. If you want to download this demonstration file, of course, without the dropship model, then you can pick it up on my Gomorrah profile for free. That way you can dissect the effects and easily copy them over to your own projects. So like I said earlier on in the video, this dropship model was picked up from the Sketchfab store. Sketchfab is mostly known for providing a high quality 3D model viewing service for the web, which is great for sharing your work with other people and for really enhancing your portfolios in an interactive way. But something that not many people know about is their online store service. If you are a 3D artist, a Sketchfab store provides you with an opportunity to monetize your work by selling your content online. And if you're a buyer, the thing that really separates the Sketchfab store from any other online storefront is their 3D viewer, which lets you see all of the geometry and texture data before making a purchase, so there's no nasty surprises. If you need models for visual effects, game development, virtual reality, architecture or animation, then this is a great place to find resources. In my case, the store is useful because sometimes I just want to experiment with creating lighting and effects within the context of a detailed render without having to make a new subject from scratch. So grabbing something from the store to fill in that gap and provide inspiration is useful for me. But another thing that it would be useful for is study material. Since there's a lot of high quality stuff on there, there's a good reason to spend some time analyzing the content on the store and use it as a point of reference to further develop your understanding and skills. So thanks for sponsoring this video, Sketchfab. Remember you can follow me on social media or join our Discord server to share your work, take part in discussions, and get sneak previews of upcoming content. So thanks for watching, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.